Hello, everyone. My name is Ole Kagan, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator with LA County Library, and I welcome you to Work Ready Career Clarity Through Self-Assessment. Before we get going with today's event, I'd like to take care of some housekeeping and tell you a little bit about the Work Ready program. And now I'd like to tell you about the Work Ready program. Work Ready started in December of 2020 with the purpose of helping people get a job, improve their current work situation, and plan a more sustainable career path. We're doing that in two ways. One is we lend out Wi-Fi hotspots and laptops for six-week loans out of 27 library locations, breaking down one barrier to applying for a job and getting online training. And two is that we put on virtual events like this one on a range of work-related topics from basics like resumes, cover letters, interviews, to slightly more complex topics like career clarity and self-assessment, and everything from career pivots to getting work if you're 50 or older, and many, many other topics. And you can see our past classes on our YouTube channel. And I'm going to place a link to that in the chat. You can view that at your leisure. Look at all of our back catalog, if you will. And if you see something that's of interest to anybody you know, also share that as well. These classes can be an assistance to many people out there and partially through you. All right, so that's work ready. The program is brought to you by funds provided by the American Rescue Plan. And we have another program coming up next week that may be of interest, and that is work ready, building an exceptional professional image. We're going to have etiquette expert Jules Martinez Hurst uh, come teach you about appropriate work attire, confident body language, and common mistakes professionals make, and how to avoid them. You can sign up for that now. It's going to be next Tuesday, April 16th. Here is a link in the chat. Go ahead and click on that. That's absolutely free, as are all of our library programs. And if you'd like to learn more about events we have coming up, both in person and virtual, you can go to our website at lacountylibrary.org. On the top right hand side, you can click events. That'll take you to our calendar. And that calendar has all the events, both virtual and in person at 85 library locations for kids, teens, adults, older adults. And if you're just interested in digital programs, like Zoom programs like this one, if you go to our website, lacountylibrary.org, hover over that events button, and you'll get a little drop down. It says virtual programming. Click on that, and then you'll just get all the Zoom events, also for all ages, and also absolutely free. All right, and now it's time to get started with today's event. Our presenter for the day is Jennifer Rizzotti. She's a professionally trained and certified career coach and consultant. She's dedicated to helping clients define success on their own terms. For more than a decade, Jen has supported individual and organizations in transition. Following the seismic shifts of 2020, Jen pivoted to launch her own practice, where she guides individuals, small business, and corporate clients through transformational change. Jen's expertise includes employee training and development, career development coaching, and entrepreneurship. Her style has been described as energetic, methodical, and highly engaging. She's passionate about personal and professional development and lifelong learning. And with that, I bring to the stage Jen Rizzotti to tell you, give you career clarity through self-assessment. Jen, the stage is yours. Thanks, Oleg, for the kind introduction. I'm just going to pull up my slides here. Give me a moment. It's a pleasure to be back here again, partnering on the Work Ready program. If somebody could just let me know they see everything looking good there in the chat. Yep. Everything looks That's good. Perfect. Excellent. You can hear me. Okay, great. Um, well, as Oleg mentioned, I made the leap to launch my own practice in 2020 following the seismic events of the pandemic, which caused many people, including myself, to reevaluate the direction of their careers. I decided I did not want to go back to corporate America or go back to the way things were. As you progress through your own job search or career change, I encourage you to reflect not only on what you need, but also on what you want. 
When you're looking for a new job, it's actually the perfect opportunity to reflect on what matters to you and be sure your next job is really aligned with your short and long-term goals. Our agenda for today includes an exploration of career assessment tools to inform that job search and strategy. This is particularly helpful for those returning to work after a gap and or anyone on the call making a career change. We'll discuss how to use assessments to gain a clearer understanding of your natural strengths and personality traits, as well as current interests and values. Putting this all together can help you determine best fit jobs and career paths in which you will enjoy greater long-term satisfaction and fulfillment. You will be receiving a copy of these slides following the workshop, so you don't need to make notes unless you want to. That said, I would recommend jotting down any questions that come to mind. We will be holding questions until the end, and I promise to leave plenty of time for Q&A to get your burning questions on this topic answered. By the end of this session, you will understand potential benefits and limitations of assessments. You will learn about the common types of career testing instruments available. You will review samples of each assessment and learn how they differ. You will know how to leverage insights from assessments to inform your career planning. You will also receive links to various online ass assessments that you can complete if you wish to further your exploration. So why do we use assessments? Well, as a career coach, I often recommend assessments for my clients who are not sure what to do next. And this can happen at any stage of your career. So whether you're just starting out or you're feeling stuck kind of in mid-career, or maybe you're even approaching retirement, but you're still seeking something more out of your career. Assessments are a great tool for career exploration. They can help you become more self-aware and provide guidance about which direction or which directions to pursue next. This is especially helpful, as I said, for anyone seeking a job or in transition. If you're feeling uncertain or confused about how to move forward, assessments can also help you gain clarity about yourself and about opportunities that might be a better fit. In my opinion, best fit jobs are simply, simply those in which your natural talents are complemented by your personality and also in line with your values and interests. It's important to consider the big picture and you as a whole person. The benefit of doing assessments is to help you gather information. I want you to see that big picture and see yourself as a whole person. Most people and most of my clients and also including myself, we are not 100% self-aware. I think that's probably unrealistic. We all have blind spots. We all have areas that are hard for us to see. Uh, most often, these are with regard to our personality and how it impacts our relationships, work style, and our general behaviors. Often those around us may see certain things in us that we don't see for ourselves. That's very common. So you can certainly do these tests and then run your results by your loved ones. They probably would say, yep, I, I know I know that's how you are. Um, but we oftentimes have a hard time being 100% you know, self-aware and being very objective. So it's important to reflect, right? Assessments are a great tool to do that. They can also help you discover what drives you. When you're doing work you find interesting and that you're good at, this is generally very motivating. And the opposite of that is also true. Furthermore, identifying what you value in terms of a career or a job can help you make better occupational choices that lead to greater long-term satisfaction. Though there are many great benefits to assessments and I use these tools often with my clients, there are limitations to bear in mind as well. For instance, no single instrument can give you a complete picture of yourself and career tests won't and can't predict one ideal job or career path either. Your, your values and interests also change over time and so do your skills. You can always improve your skills. Career tests can't measure the depth of your potential, <clears throat> excuse me, nor can they measure your resilience. They can only give you an indication of how you operate right now. Life can take many turns, as we know, as we've probably all experienced, and our circumstances certainly impact our career changes and our, excuse me, impact our career choices and our opportunities as well. Since these tests are mostly self-reported, they contain inherent biases and inaccuracies too. Though career assessments may seem very objective when you get your results, these are almost entirely subjective. 
one exception being aptitude testing, which we'll discuss in a few moments. Career assessments generally evaluate these five things. About aptitudes, interests, personality, skills, and values. We're going to explore each of these in more detail over the next few slides. Commonly, one test that you take will actually measure a few of these at the same time. So they're measuring multiple variables. I've tried to kind of split them off into individuals. So if you take the online test, I recommend there, you know, some of them are mixed, but for the most part, it's just that particular item. Um, but you'll have to bear that in mind. You'll think about why do I want to use a career assessment right now? Then you'll spend some time focusing on which of these categories would be most helpful. If you're making a job change and you require some new skills that you need to brush up on, maybe you'll take some skills tests. Um, if you're not sure where you're headed, I'd probably recommend some interest tests or values, things like that. So you'll have to think about of these five things, I don't want you to go out and take you know, 30 assessments online and, and kind of drive yourself crazy with all these different results. It's, it's not the point of it. It's really to be selective about know where you are right now, know what would be most helpful and just start there. Most people have a general sense of what they're good at. Those are your aptitudes, especially if they've been in the workforce for some time. But if you're still early in your career and you're not sure what your natural strengths are, then investing in some aptitude testing could be worthwhile. If you're well into your career, but have never really found your way, it could be very valuable to explore your interests and your personality more in depth. Increasing self-awareness at any age can help move the needle in the right direction. Similarly, as you approach mid-career or retirement, it might be worthwhile to revisit what you value in terms of fulfillment and make adjustments if you're feeling off course. A career change, for instance, will probably require you to learn new skills, and assessments can help pinpoint exact, you know, more precise areas to focus on. Individuals who experience greater job satisfaction over their careers take the time to periodically reflect on and reevaluate where they're headed. Career planning is a conscious choice. Of all, the, of all the instruments available, aptitude testing is generally the most reliable. What I mean by reliable is a test that gives you the same result over time. Whether you take an aptitude test this year, two years from now, 10 years from now, you should generally receive a similar result with regard to your aptitudes. These tests are more commonly administered in an educational setting or a professional setting by an employer. Though you can seek some resources on your own, these are not self-guided and they usually involve a proctor or a specialized practitioner. And unless you're doing it through a university or school, it's probably gonna cost you some money. And that's another reason they tend to be the most accurate as well because you have someone actually observing how you operate and observing your behaviors. Aptitude testing measures what you're naturally good at and thus how well you might perform certain tasks. These can indicate your potential for success in a certain job or field. Here are some aptitudes that are by no means uh, is this list exhaustive, but some of the basic ones include um, abstract reasoning, numerical reasoning, spatial reasoning. Uh, maybe you have a, an ear for music. Maybe you're naturally athletic. Maybe you can easily learn languages or you're able to take things apart and fix things. These are generally, aptitudes are generally referred to as your gifts. People say you're either, you've got it or you don't. Um, you know, things like perfect pitch, you either have perfect pitch if you're a music person or you don't. I've been tested, I can tell you I don't. I'm not musically inclined whatsoever. Um, I don't see the full spectrum of color either. So I probably would not make the best artist. That came as a surprise. Um, I also lack spatial reasoning. And you might think, Jen, why does this matter? Why do I care? Well, I can tell you this has actually had real effects on my life. I, lack of spatial reasoning and the ability to see things in three dimensions, believe it or not, is pretty important because we live in a three-dimensional world. Um, I actually scored in the 10th percentile for spatial reasoning, which is the lowest I've ever scored on any test. Um, this explained after many years, why I have always struggled to drive a car. Like I have to very much focus on driving I struggle to perceive the dimensions of a vehicle. I'm not an excellent driver. Um, I've actually driven into several drive-through windows, like actually like the, the side window, the place you place, you know, the little box where you place your order. I've hit, you know, fences, medians, like very minor things over the years, but I've, I've like had a string of kind of minor accidents. So this test result actually explained to me, this is why I struggle with driving actually. Um, anyway, there was a scientifically supported reason for all the kind of fender benders I have, why my rims, you know, grind up against the curbs. I, I literally 
I don't know the dimensions of a vehicle. So nobody on this call is ever going to let me, you know, park their car. But I had a, actually kind of a funny story, but any jobs requiring spatial awareness would obviously be a terrible fit for me. Um, and I did have a summer job in high school and in college when I was um, working on ferry boats for many summers. And a couple of the summers I was working on the ferry boats that travel with cars and I had to park the cars. And I was like 16 and I thought it was because I was a young you know, person, I just couldn't park the cars. Well, let me tell you, I had multiple accidents um, involving big rigs, RVs. I could not perceive the dimensions of their vehicle at all. And I could not direct the customers on the boat correctly. So after the third or fourth accident, I believe the captain definitely took me off that. I was allowed to park small cars. Um, and the following summer, I was actually invited to narrate tours on a cruise boat instead. There were no vehicles. It was just passengers. And lo and behold, talking on the microphone was a much better job for me. So understanding your natural aptitudes is helpful because it helps you rule out certain career paths and it can help you rule in certain career paths. Uh, but they don't take into consideration whether you're interested in doing a certain type of work. For instance, my aptitude testing revealed I was great with numbers, which I knew from experience over the years, it always came easy to me, but I never had any interest in pursuing jobs that leverage that ability. So just because you're good at something doesn't mean you wanna make it your career. I love talking to people and teaching and I would probably be bored crunching numbers or formulas all day. Um, but one suitable path might've been a, a math teacher or professor that might've been something that would be a good fit with my aptitudes and my personality, but I didn't really aspire to that either. My aptitude testing also revealed I had really great dexterity and fine motor skills, which again, you think, what does that matter? Um, the practitioner, the administrator said, wow, you, you know, you'd make an excellent surgeon. Had you considered surgery? And I said, no, I, at this point I was in my thirties and it was far too late for me to conceive of medical school, residency, student loans, anything like that. Plus I had no interest in medicine. Um, my personality type is one that doesn't like high risk situations. I would make a terrible surgeon. So the point is you have to know yourself and you have to make informed decisions that balance your aptitudes with your interests and your personality type. So though I might've been good at certain things, I had no interest in pursuing them. So of all the testing, um, by this stage of career where you've been working for a few years, you probably have a general idea of what you're good at. So most of the aptitude testing is probably gonna reveal things that don't come as a surprise. Like not, nothing in my results came as a surprise. And you, know, you, you kind of have to be looking for some things specific when you're doing aptitude testing. So I would say it's most effective early in career. Um, if you haven't done any aptitude testing by your mid twenties, it might be definitely worthwhile. Um, but by a certain point you reach your thirties and forties, you kind of know I'm either good at that or I'm not. And most of the time things we're interested in, we're, we're better at um, and the opposite is also true. So these are some sample aptitude questions just for fun. We're not gonna kind of like hurt our brains and kind of answering these, but these are the type of questions you might see on a numerical reasoning test, for instance. Um, this one measures math skills for all of you out there that are interested. What was the percentage increase in snowfall in Whistler from November to December? So if we look at November, the orange line is Whistler, that's 20. In December, the orange line is 30. So that's a 10 centimeter difference. So 10 is half or 50% of 20. So there was a 50% increase from November to December. So these are the type of questions you might see. Sample logical reasoning question. This is one to kind of test your powers of pattern, sequence, recognition, which of the boxes comes next in the sequence. Um, and again, if you want to take any of these tests, there's some freebies on practiceaptitudetest.com. This one is tricky. Um, the answer here is actually C letter C, so that, that box there. Um, the squares are moving from the top to the middle to the bottom right with each turn. Unshaded squares appear every third turn. Triangle appears every alternate turn. Therefore, the black unshaded square should be in the middle with no triangle. Now, I didn't come up with that answer. That's from the test. I can tell you that I did get this one looking right. I, I did this get this one right. I had to study it for a little while, um, but I could kind of see in my mind, okay, I expect this is the next one in the sequence, but I could never give you that explanation. I could never tell you why. I could just see the answer. So that's the difference between aptitudes and skills. Skills are learned and they can be improved. You could certainly learn how to better answer these type of questions for an SAT, an ACT, maybe a professional exam, like you're becoming a certified engineer or getting a credential. Like these are the types of questions you see on those types of tests, right? It's a, it's a credentialing exam or a professional exam or 
or a college entrance exam, things like that. So you can learn to answer these questions better. Um, but if you have a natural aptitude for these questions, you're just gonna get the answer right every time and you're not gonna have to think too much about it. So that's the difference between aptitudes and skills, no matter the years have passed. Like I said, these are hard questions. Uh, the fun stuff is happening in personality testing and we'll get there in a moment. Um, but this is just a last sample question for all the engineers out there. I have no spatial reasoning as I've uh, acknowledged and I have no mechanical reasoning abilities. So I would definitely never get this question right. I wouldn't even try. Um, how many revs per second is C? Turning the answer is 10 revs per second. So that's option two. Uh, Cog A has five teeth, can do a full revolution per second. Cog C with 20 takes four times as long. So I guess you divide 40 by four for the answer. So I could do the math on that, but I could never could never get that answer for you correct. So I'm gonna leave the answers here. Excuse me, these are just for fun, uh, but I wanna give you a sample of, of aptitude testing and it's not easy. The ones you find easy are the ones you're naturally gifted at. And again, these are from practiceaptitudetest.com if you're curious. So shifting gears into something a bit lighter, um, moving into interest assessments next. These measure your preferences for certain activities or job tasks. They are immensely helpful to identify what you like to do, what you might like to do. Maybe you love art, writing, healthcare, education. Maybe you love working on computers or building things or selling things. It's important to recognize our interests can and do evolve over time. What you love doing at one point may fade, and it's helpful to reflect on what you're interested in doing now or next. You know, there are some people who are happy and fulfilled doing the same thing for most of their careers. Um, I will say I wanted to be one of those people. I felt they were superior humans. You know, the people we all know who said from the time they were four years old, they knew they wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer, and they went on to have um, a well-distinguished career in the same profession for decades. And I you know, I always felt bad about myself that I didn't have that. Like, I'm never going to have like one thing that I do my whole life. And I, I never really knew what I wanted to do. It was a winding road to kind of get to where I'm at today. And it was not a linear path at all. So it took me years to realize and to accept, like give myself the acceptance that it would actually be boring for me to do that. I would be bored doing one thing for the rest of my life. It's okay to have many interests. It's okay to be a multifaceted person. I think now more than ever, we find it's desirable to change jobs and change careers, but it wasn't always that way. So I learned through my own interest testing and values testing that I actually value variety more than having expertise in one thing. I value new experiences and ongoing learning much more than I value total mastery in the same thing over my lifetime. So I will probably evolve from a career coach in a few years down the road into doing something else because that's what I'm, you know, that's how I stay interested and that's okay. Chances are, if you're in the workshop today, you're not the type of person who wants to do one thing for your entire life either, or you would already be doing it. You would not be searching. This is a sample interest test called the ONET Interest Profiler. It's available at onetcenter.org. It's based on John Holland's Ryasek model, which describes six different interest areas we'll talk about in a moment. Um, it's a very quick and simple assessment, much easier on the eyes than you know, aptitude testing. And it's generally accurate for most people. The ONET website is a great tool to complete the test and also get inspiration on different occupational choices that match your results. You can enter your interest codes from your results into the uh, website and it will give you a list of jobs that match your interests. It's actually quite fun. If you, you know, if you find these quizzes fun, which I do, I mean, I'm a career coach, but um, if you find it fun, we like to learn about ourselves. Um, you simply rank on a scale of one to five, how much you would like or dislike doing each type of work. For example, study ways to reduce water pollution. For me, I would dislike that. Um, writing books or plays, that's I'm kind of neutral on that. Maybe I like some writing and creative, but I'm kind of in the middle. Try not to think about if you have the education or the training to do the job. This is just to get about what you're interested in. So just think about whether you would like to do the work or not. Repair household appliances. We know from my mechanical abilities, that would be a no. But giving career guidance to people, there I am. Number 19, I would check that I would like that very much. And here's the last sample of the ONET. And again, this is available online. You could probably take it in about 10 minutes. The Holland Code and the Ryasek model have been around a long time. Ryasek is an acronym that stands for the following, realistic, investigative, artistic, social, enterprising, and conventional. When you complete this test or another test based on the Ryasek model, you will have a few top interest areas. 
the top three become your Holland code. And you can search for careers compatible with your code, as I said, on that website in the order of your preference. If you don't want to complete the test, you can just go to this slide and kind of look at the descriptions of each type here. And you can just decide which group you are most drawn to. For instance, I when I read these descriptions, I'm drawn to the helping professions. It's social. I don't think of myself as particularly social, but again, these terms have been around, this test has been around a long time, you know, decades. So some of the language you might see in these tests that have been around 60, 70, 80 years, the language might be not what we kind of interpreted as today, but I don't think of myself as totally social, but I do like to be in a helping profession. So for me, I identify as social, people who like to work with people, to enlighten, inform, help, train, skilled with words, et cetera. That's where I identify. Um, my top three results are actually tied. So conventional, well, not tied. Conventional is actually slightly higher for me than social. So though conventional is my top result, I identify more as social. So I list that as kind of my number one. Um, my third one came in as artistic, which is not so much of a surprise. I do like to be creative, but not necessarily in the, you know, creating art sense. Um, so if you don't want to take the test, even though it's short, you could just read the descriptions here and pick your top three. Who do I want to hang out with first? After that, who would be the next group of people I'd be drawn to? And after that, pick your third choice. The Holland Code is the, the three letters that correspond to your preferences. Moving on to always a crowd favorite, personality assessments. These are generally the most fun to complete. For some people, the results can be hard to digest though because they do not shield you from what you perceive as maybe your less ideal traits or your less uh, desirable traits. They give you the good, the bad, and the ugly, so to speak. Naturally, there are no better or worse personality types, but there are certain behaviors that can become challenging, especially in a workplace setting, if we don't know how to manage our unique selves. So personality tests measure your uniqueness and also how you typically react or respond in everyday situations, including work, including relationships, etc. Personality tests are generally pretty accurate, but only if you are honest when answering the questions. If you lack self-awareness, or maybe you're in denial about some less, you know, savory aspects, as I said, of your personality, you won't get as much out of these assessments. So it's really in your best interest, to be honest. Um, there are no right or wrong types. There are no better or worse types. I know we sometimes aspire to be, like, I aspire to be the person who could do the same job for decades, but that's just not my personality. I would be bored, and I had to kind of accept to myself, like, there's a right answer I want to give. I want to be this type of person, um, but I'm just not that type of person. So again, you know, you have to kind of think of your tests in the same light. Um, there is a tendency to say, like, oh, I wish I was that answer, but you know you're kind of not. And, and I think it's better to uh, know, like you can adapt your personality. I've had to adapt. We've all had to adapt at work. So yes, you can change over time. You can be a more versatile person. Um, you can kind of suppress certain aspects of your personality that may not benefit you. You can also enhance kind of certain aspects that help you move forward. So again, just bearing all that in mind as we go through these slides. One test that's also been around for a long time and generally reliable is Raymond Cattell's 16PF. This stands for 16 personality factors. And again, this test is from, I believe, 1949. So some of the language or words you see might kind of you know, reflect different time periods. But for the most part, I just wanted to mention that. Um, this instrument is based on a taxonomy of 16 primary traits. And it gives a pretty accurate picture of what I call the whole person. It's been around, yes, 75 years, so 1949. And so there are decades of research to support the accuracy of this test. It's a popular tool for career coaches, and you can actually complete an online version for free, uh, which is fantastic. This is the list of 16 personality factors measured in the test. Each factor is measured along a spectrum. You know, warmth, for instance, is gonna range from being reserved to being outgoing. Dominance would range from being humble to being assertive. Vigilance ranges from being trusting to suspicious. Abstractedness from practical to imaginative. And self-reliance would range from being very dependent on a group to being very self-sufficient. And again, you kind of see these descriptors as you go through the test, um, but know that we all fall somewhere along the range of these variables. This is a sample section of the test. You can see in all these tests, I don't know if you've noticed, but they're mostly written at, a, I believe, a fifth grade or an eighth grade, depending on the test. Um, they're, they're, you know, 
uh, skill level. So if it's a reading level of fifth grade, all these tests, you know, a fifth grader should be able to read and understand what this means or an eighth grader for some of the instruments, but it's not, it doesn't require, um, you know, anything beyond that. So the goal is these tests are accessible when you read them, you should be able to answer them relatively easily. You shouldn't have to look up any words or do anything like that. And that's by, that's by design. So I just wanted to give you a little preview of what this test looks like. And I would recommend if you have time, take this one online for free. It's, it's definitely one of the the better ones. Um, naturally, there are no kind of better or worse traits to have, but this gives you a kind of a sampling here. Um, so things like I take time out for others, I take control of things, I'm not easily frustrated. You would just rate how strongly you agree or disagree on that item. You cheer people up, you let others make decisions and so forth. And so this is a fun one. This one's available on open psychometrics.org. And I will put all these in a, uh, the resource page at the end of this deck as well. So you can kind of just click right out of the deck into the website if you like. The big five personality test is another popular one, especially because it's online and you can take it for free. Um, the instrument measures your big five traits along a spectrum as well. And everybody's on the spectrum. Like you, you're gonna fall somewhere from one end to the other. Maybe you're in the middle, um, but we all are unique and we all individual. So it kind of helps you know, you to be more understanding of your coworkers, your spouse, you know, your kids, like knowing we, we all have different traits. Um, and, and that sometimes if somebody's kind of like rubbing you the wrong way, you're probably just, you know, your personalities clash. And I know that's a cliche, but it's actually true. Like there's scientifically, you know, supported reasons for that. So I just want you to bear that in, in mind too. Um, so this one measures the traits of openness, conscientiousness, that's openness to experience, by the way, um, conscientious, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And again, these tests have kind of been around a while. So neuroticism being how kind of sensitive you are and nervous versus resilient and confident. Here are some sample questions from the big five. I am the life of the party. That one for me is like a disagree. I feel a little concerned for others, also a disagree. Um, the first question, life of the party, that naturally measures your extroversion, how outgoing and energetic you are. Feeling little concern for others measures your agreeableness. That's what they're calling it. So how friendly, how compassionate you are versus how critical or judgmental you might be. I get stressed out easily. That measures your, what they call neuroticism, how sensitive or nervous you are versus being resilient and confident. Um, I am always prepared. That's a strongly agree for me. Uh, that measures my conscientiousness, how efficient and organized versus how extravagant or careless. And lastly, I have a rich vocabulary that measures your openness to experience and how inventive or curious you are. I don't talk a lot. That prompt is actually measuring the opposite of extroversion. So they, they refer to it as the opposite of extroversion, but that's going to measure uh, how solitary and reserved you are if you prefer not to talk a lot. Again, your results on these tests are only as accurate as your responses. And because you're the only pe person seeing these tests, um, I would recommend you be honest so you can kind of get the most out of it. Even if you aspire to be somebody who has a rich vocabulary, if you're not, own it, get a dictionary, start looking stuff up when you read a book, and you can grow in that area if you want to. Um, but again, have, have fun with this. So moving on to skills test next, we won't spend as much time on these because they are more straightforward in terms of interpretation. They're also far too numerous to talk about on the Zoom today. There are thousands of skills tests available. Um, they measure both hard skills like computer tests, you know, computer skills, and they measure soft skills like emotional intelligence or communication. So skills tests are most often used by employers. You might have taken some at work if your company values you know, employee development, they've probably given you the opportunity to take some skills tests over the years. Um, increasingly, we see skill tests are being offered as part of your application process. So you, during the screening process, when you apply for a job and you're being selected, hopefully being selected, you might be invited to take some tests online or some personality tests. And that's what they're doing is they're trying to assess before they even like bring you in is would you be a fit for the job? Do you have the skills? Do you have the traits they're looking for? Um, so if you've taken any, you know, uh, applications recently and you've been invited to test before you even really complete your process that's what's happening here it's part of the screening and selection process um, you can take some skills tests online for free i don't think it's necessarily effective um, what i think is more effective is to decide what your current skills are now against a job that you really want so if you're looking to get the next job it's a different job and it requires some skills you don't have identifying that gap which is called the skills gap between where you are and where you want to go that I think is more effective. So learning what it will take to bridge that gap 
then maybe go forth, look for some skills, you know, test to kind of measure yourself in those areas. So you know how you, you know, what you have to work at. That, in my opinion, is more valuable because there are just too many skills to consider. Some of the common ones might be math, language, writing, computer, leadership, problem solving, et cetera. Um, and again, I think you could also just rank your skills. If you look at a job description, I often tell my clients, just rank yourself with regard to proficiency. If they have 10 items listed, then mark whether you are a beginner in that area, whether you're proficient or whether you're an expert. And when you kind of mark up your job descriptions, you'll see at a glance what your opportunities are. You're like, wow, I'm kind of basic at computer skills. I could maybe brush up on that um, or something like your technical writing, for instance, professional writing. Maybe you need to brush up on that. So I would recommend looking at skills when you're looking at job descriptions. I think that's the most practical way to actually use the information. Um, and then, you know, for instance, if you're like, I don't feel comfortable with computers, this is holding me back from jobs, by all means, go to the library, go to the YouTube channel that you know Oleg has, look for some ways to improve your computer skills um, and, or seek out some other advice at the library. And then you could kind of you know, move forward in that way as well. But you kind of have to know where you are and where you're headed and just decide what might help you. So remember, your skills can always be improved upon with determination and practice. This is the growth mindset with many of us have heard about now, but we didn't always know about 10 or 20 years ago. We weren't always having those kind of conversations. But what we know now is our skills are not fixed from birth. You know, our aptitudes generally are, but our skills are not. You know, you might have a natural talent for drawing or art, but you can still take art classes. You can still create amazing works of art. You can have a successful career as an artist, even if it's not your natural gift, right? If you work hard at something and you're interested in it, you can improve those skills. And I believe, you know, there's that book, I think it's, is it Malcolm uh, Gladwell with the 10,000 hours, the, that whole theory of like, you could play the piano for 10,000 hours. That's what it kind of takes to be an expert. And I think that's true of anything. It doesn't require 10,000 hours. I think most of us can become an expert with like three to 500 hours. Sometimes it really doesn't take that much to get proficient at something, maybe a thousand hours or more. You're feeling really confident. But when you think about what you do day in, day out, 40 hours a week, that's how we're, you know, getting good at something, you know, it just takes practice over time. So remember that um, you can always decide what you want to work on and do so. Um, the only limitations with regard to your skills and your future are those placed on yourself. So we've got about 10 minutes left before we move into Q&A. Um, I want to make a few moments for what I call values assessments. Um, this is the last in the uh, items that we're going to cover. And these are just in alphabetical order. They're not in order of importance at all. Um, but these tests reveal what is most important to you right now in your career. These also change over time. So it is important to periodically check in with yourself about what matters, I would say right now, whether it's this next three months, this next six months, this next year, I just think in terms of short windows, you know, I don't really recommend my clients try to plan their careers more than six to 12 months out. Once you're in a job, yes, you might take a three to five year track. But if you're just looking for a job or you're in transition, have like your three month goals, your six month goals. And by this time next year, you'll be in a different space. Um, but I don't recommend looking too far into the future because get, quite frankly, things change. And after you take some of these tests, you might find your interests change as well. So when searching for jobs, you can actually gauge if the job description and company will be in alignment with your values or not. These again are immensely helpful when you're at a career crossroads or when you're in transition, because once you understand what matters to you, it's much easier to find a job that fits you. It eliminates a lot of trial and error. This is my values assessment tool. If you've been in my classes before on Zoom, I think I shared this once. I also shared this in person a lot and I use this with my clients a lot. I know it looks like a very simple assessment, very simple kind of uh, reflection and it only takes about five to 10 minutes, but it actually can save you weeks and months in terms of your job search because it, it makes you get clear about what you really want right now. And again, this test in six months or a year the answers probably will change. But um, we're gonna maybe just take a moment here. If people feel comfortable, they can drop some of the questions into the chat box if they wanna engage a little bit. But when you do this exercise at home, and again, I would say do it sometime in the next seven days so it's fresh in your mind, so this class is fresh in your mind. Um, and I want you to think about for a moment, what do you value in terms of job and career right now? And I'm gonna bring up the chat box. And what you can do is if you're at home, you can write it down on paper or you can start to make your list. But I want you to create what I call your ideal work wish list. And these things may not be realistic to get in one job right now, but I want you to list them. I want you to name them. You know, if you need to make a certain amount of money or you want to make a certain amount of money, I want you to write that figure down. Um, if you want to work from home, you know, I want you to write that down. So if, if you feel comfortable, you can drop kind of some of your work wish list into the chat box and I'll just see what we have there. 
if anybody wants to share, but a lot of the, you know, common ones that we see are a certain type of arrangement, you know, working from home, certain salary, maybe it's a small company, maybe it's a large company, maybe it's childcare, maybe it's making an impact, being a part of a company with a strong culture, um, opportunity for growth, work-life balance. I'm saying, yeah, blow up the chat box for a second. I'm just kind of curious, intellectual stimulation. These are all things I want you to take and write down because you're gonna have somewhere between seven and 10 items, safety, that security is a big one. Um, these are kind of the factors, machine, remote, there we go. We've got people identifying here um, with their aptitudes and strengths as well. Um, creative liberty, that's a huge one. Environmentally friendly, I feel like we should screenshot this because then I could add these to my, the list of the inspo that I give, helping others. Yeah, flexibility for acting, awesome. Elderly parents, caring for family, getting into tech, health insurance benefits. Let me tell you as a self-employed person, that would be a big one. Big reason I'd return back to the general workforce, team collaboration, passion. Now you can see all these answers are very different because we're all individuals. We all have different personalities, um, different things that matter to us. And again, this is, you know, some of these things might matter to you in six months or a year, but a lot of times these things change. Like right now I have a young son. If you want me back in an office Monday through Friday, I would like some allowance for childcare. You know, I would like some, I would love on-site childcare. I'd love to work for a company that has daycare on site. That would probably get me back to an office Monday through Friday, things like that. Ability to grow, humane environment and mission, flexibility, working on a team, joyful surroundings, stability, flexibility, retirement. Yes, let's talk retirement. That's important. You don't really get that very much anymore. Um, public service, work from home. Be your own boss. Someone needs to be on my entrepreneur class coming up here, continuing to help people at a different stage of career work-life balance. So you kind of get the idea. I'm going to kind of pause looking at the chat and kind of get back us, get us back on track here, but financially fruitful. Um, these are all the things I want you to come up with. And I love everybody. Thank you who shared in the chat because it gives us ideas. I'm someone who has a hard time sometimes coming up with my own ideas. I'm like, wait, oh, that's a good one. And so if you saw something that you liked in the chat, feel free to make it one of your top seven to 10. And once you have your list, and again, it's usually about seven to 10 factors, um, I want you to circle your top three. So you would circle like, for instance, and this is just right now. This is not like for your whole career. This is right now, I'm looking at jobs, I'm going back to work, what are my top three? My top three would be childcare, certain salary to kind of make up for the childcare if it's not covered and maybe flexibility work from home. Those might be my top three, I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Once you have your top three, circle them. And then if you can, rank them. So what's your number one? What's your number two? What's your number three? That way you kind of know your order of your importance. Um, what I do is with my clients call these, these are your non-negotiables. So when you have your top three, and again, you can complete this at home, I would say those are your non-negotiables. Anytime you're looking at jobs, if they don't contain at a minimum your top three, I would recommend you pass and look for the opportunities that do because you've taken this time. And again, it's not a long time. It's five to 10 minutes to say like right now, for the next three months, six months, 12 months, these are the things that are most important to me that I really value. Your job should, in my opinion, have some of those non-negotiables. So I just want you to kind of think about that. And you can use this tool to inform your job search. Again, I probably would say it's not the right opportunity if it doesn't even have your top three and it's not gonna have all seven to 10, I promise. It's not realistic. You might create that for yourself. You might have that in the next job. You can always aspire to kind of get all your variables met, but it's sort of like finding the right house, finding the right partner. You kind of say, okay, I can live with that, but I can't live with, with certain things, right? There are certain things you just have to rule out. So I want you to identify what your non-negotiables are for right now for your current job search. So what do you do now with all these insights? How do we move forward? To a degree, it depends, you know, what stage of career you're at and what you're looking to do next in terms of opportunity. Um, you know, when I've done these calls in the past, there's a wide range of people on this call, maybe early career approaching retirement. You know, you're talking, we're spanning for, you know, 40, 50 years sometimes of work history on these Zooms, which is exciting. Um, so I want to kind of identify this in, in our remaining time per stage of career, at least, you know, for the major stages of career. Um, if you're early career and you're on this call, I would suggest you keep trying new things and just try to get exposure to a wide variety of jobs and industries. At this stage of your life, sometimes trial and error is more impactful because you just haven't had enough jobs yet to compare other jobs to. If someone said you want to do that, it's like, well, I don't know. I've, I've never done it. Right. So I would say don't rush it. If you're in your teens and 20s, you're, you're even up, you're like late 20s. People get really freaked out about that. Your 20s, in my opinion, you're, you know, the first decade that you're working is really a time of exploration. Um, you don't have to rush to figure things out. 
Um, you probably know what you're good at, but you might have many interests. So, you know, you can use assessments to help you see a more complete picture of your strengths and they can help you narrow down your interests so you can start, you know, narrowing down your job choices. Um, some, you know, just start someplace that feels right now. Um, but your results might also point you in directions you'd never considered. If you're mid-career, and by mid-career, I think you've been working 10 years or longer. So say you're in the 10 to 15 years or longer club, approaching midlife, uh, approaching mid-career, I would suggest, um, you know, assessments can be helpful to help you measure if you're still on track. So if you're happy with what you're doing, if you work in healthcare and you're happy in healthcare, if your current job and your career path are still in line with what you're interested in, then I would say you could use assessments to really deepen your skills. Um, you can refine or deepen maybe uh, like your communication skills, your emotional intelligence, say if you're a leader, but you feel like you're lacking certain things. Um, the kind of mid-career assessments are great to really refine that expertise and really deepen you know, your skills. Um, assessments can also reveal current opportunities for growth and that can really help you evolve. And if you kind of hit a plateau where you're like, I'm just not moving up, I'm just not moving forward, I'm getting passed over for opportunity. Well, you know, maybe these assessments will help you re reveal some opportunities to help you keep growing personally and professionally. So it's great if you're feeling stuck. Um, it was great if you're, if you're doing great, you can kind of use assessments to go a little bit further in the direction you're headed. But if you're feeling stuck or you're feeling stagnant with where you are, then assessments can actually pave the way toward a career change. And that's where many of you on this call may be today. So career change can happen at any stage, um, whether you've been working five years, 50 years, the considerations on this list are all the same. You know, most often I see big career changes um, kind of approaching that mid-career, at least after you've been working almost 10 years to 20 years is, is most common. Um, but recently, this generation, this last decade, I'm not sure what it is. I haven't looked at the research on it, but um, I just see big pivots and I see big changes happening like much sooner. Every three to four years, I feel like someone's doing something new. And it's, it's part of it, I think, is the world we live in technology. Part of it is just the where we're headed. Um, you have to be adaptable and you have to really, you know, kind of evolve all the time and refine your skills. So there is a different, it's changing now, it's changing. Um, but I am seeing that happen. But of course, you can decide to change course at any time. Natural times are often when you start a family or maybe you get laid off or you're simply burnt out. Uh, those are often times to kind of think about, am I ready for a change? Assessments can help illuminate new paths forward that may fit with your personality. But in theory, you shouldn't have to totally start over. There are some big career changes that may require you to go back to school or get some training. So that kind of puts you back at a beginner level. But if you like your field, as we said, you're in healthcare, but maybe you're wanting to transition from a clinical role like a nurse to an administrative role, like be a department head or something. Um, assessments can help you determine how to make the change, what jobs might be a fit. And again, your employer might have access to these assessments. Most of them do. So they will kind of help you with some of these tests along the way and kind of you know make the change for you with you as well. Um, but the same goes for anyone struggling to make a change or if you just feel like you've never found what makes you happy, you know, then it would be time to think about a change. Um, for instance, I've always preferred to be an independent contributor instead of a manager. I have managed people in the past and teams and I just I didn't like it. Um, I will say that's because I it's not my personality type. Like I prefer to work alone. It's OK. I feel OK saying that now because I work alone. But it, for a long time, I felt like people would talk to me at the office and I was like, I just I just want to do my work. You know, I, you know, I just want to be in my kind of my my cup, my cubicle. So um, I like autonomy over work. I like, you know, flexibility to work from home. I like to just kind of control my work and have like laissez-faire type situation from leadership. So I've never really been a good manager and I don't want to be a manager. And that's okay. I don't aspire. I don't aspire to do that. My career path is not requiring that of me. But if you're someone who's a manager who's unhappy because you don't like working with people, then, you know, maybe you realize I'm more of an independent contributor. And, and I think that you know, one thing to bear in mind is a lot of career paths kind of track you into leadership and track you into manager roles, even if that's not suiting your personality. You know, those are things to consider. That's just kind of how a lot of professions work. So I recommend, you know, taking some time to measure your values and interests and, you know, be clear about where you're headed next. If you're approaching the end of your working years and you're thinking about retirement, assessments are valuable for the same reasons. It's a natural time to think about how many years you have left how you would like to spend that time wisely. Maybe there are boxes you still wanna check. Maybe you wanna build a legacy or volunteer your time or just do something totally new, like start a business, become an entrepreneur. Um, it's a natural time to reflect and assessments are great to promote that self-reflection and to help you identify what you actually wanna do next. Um, if you've got an ear for music or talent that you've never had a chance to pursue, it's a great time to explore new hobbies. Um, if we have time in the Q&A or I'll, I'll kind of share a story of somebody I know who did like have a whole nother career and he's in his retirement, but now he's not retired. He's coming out of retirement. 
um, to be an actor, which is really fun after decades in the insurance business or something totally different. So it, it really is never too late to make a change um, and, I, and try something new. Just a few helpful reminders you can kind of bear in mind as we you know, are wrapping up the presentation part of our discussion here. But success is really, in my opinion, doing what you want to do. Um, it looks like that freedom and you have the skills to do what you want to do. My current job is really not different from what I used to do in corporate America. The only difference is I work for myself now and I have that autonomy and freedom and I get to work alone most of the time. But I do love doing these Zooms and because I am a social person in that way as well. So again, it's knowing yourself and kind of crafting the right fit for you right now. But it's very individual. So I don't want you to compare yourself. Certainly don't compare your test results to anybody else. We are all unique and you know, give, give people grace. We're all on our own journeys. This is just kind of a, if you're a visual person, this is what it looks like, you know, where you're naturally good at something, it matches your personality and your skills and aptitudes. That is kind of career satisfaction. Remember, there's no good or bad results. This is just something to keep in mind as you take any of these assessments going forward. And I'm including a list of recommended resources to further your exploration. Most of these are free. There's a couple with asterisks that are paid. The ONET has an asterisk in the name. That's not a paid test. That's a great free test. I just want to mention that. But the other ones with asterisks um, are paid resources. And I would recommend you do probably some, at least a personality test, an interest test, and a values test. Um, I don't think you need to do any aptitude or skills testing unless you're, you know, the skills are holding you back from something. Um, but I just want to kind of call that out. And the personality are the most fun. Including my contact info, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn or keep in touch after the class, I do offer individualized coaching. And I have special rates for LA Library participants as well that I'll honor within 90 days of the workshop. We're gonna move into the Q&A box. I see we've got some chats there. I'm gonna turn it over to Oleg for a minute, perhaps to moderate and see what we can get into. But I appreciate everyone's attention. If you've been in my classes, you know I tend to bite off an ambitious amount of information and content that I wanna share. And I hope I've been able to do that with you today. So thank you for your attention and engagement. Thank you very much, Jen. That was a really interesting presentation. I, I echo what some of the folks in the chat said. Somebody said, I feel seen. And looking at some of those results, I'm like, that's me right there. That's me. Yes. Yeah. And um, I'm sure like your spouse, your loved ones, you'll, they'll notice it, right? But like, we don't always see it. Like, oh, sometimes it, so it really takes now. the, you know, takes that kind of outside assessment to make that happen. So it's, it's definitely true. And I've, I know I've, I've taken, you mentioned during the presentation that uh, the, uh, the measure of a good assessment or kind of the way you know assessment is good is if you take it multiple times and mm -hmm. you can what's and then you get a similar result. And I've done a few where that's been the case. And it's, it's actually surprised me because I, it's a like years apart and I didn't remember at all what I had put in the other one. And it just, and it, it happened that they were almost identical. I like, compared them both. They were identical. It was really interesting. Do you recall, Oleg, was it a personality test or an aptitude strength it type test? It was the strengths deployment inventory, SDI. Strengths. Strengths. Okay, that's a good one. I looked for that for free. I couldn't find it. It's paid. Like I couldn't find yeah. a free version. So maybe you had the opportunity to do it at work yeah, because I, I wanted work. to include that one as well. Okay, but a lot of times we get these at work. Yeah, that's interesting. So that's, mm. yeah. Yeah, it was a good. It was really, it was really th that one specifically has a really interesting approach, and so yeah. But yeah, a lot of them also do. So let's get into the questions. Uh, I know somebody had just mentioned they don't see the resources. I'm on a cell phone. Yes, so oh, the resources can, are yeah. they're in the slides. So you'll you'll receive the slides by email. So don't worry if you don't see them now. You will you will get them. You'll be able to click all through um, on the on the PDF and see all of the assessments that Jen has talked about during the presentation. Thank you for clarifying that. All right, so let's get into some of these questions. So first of all, I'm unclear if there's a market on where my interests lie. Any recommendations on building resilience to pursue these or when it might be wise or misguided? So where interests lie, I don't know if the person could drop into the chat but what with more specifically the interests so we could be more specific in an answer. on um, building resilience, you know, this is where I think, finding community, finding your tribe. And now it's easier than ever with social media. You can find people on Instagram. You can follow people on LinkedIn that inspire you. So whatever your interests are and, and um, you know, kind of keeping it in the general sense, I would say find your tribe, you know, find the people doing what you're interested in because you're going to get inspiration there on, you know, should I do this? Should I consider this? Should I not consider this? You might be able to, you know, um, 
finagle some informational interviews or even just DM people on Instagram. I mean, it's the world we live in now, the access we have to people doing what we want to do is huge. I mean, it's, it's, it's like the world is so interconnected. So I think I would start on social media, LinkedIn, whatever spaces you're on, if you feel comfortable, you can also do it in person. You know, if you're like, Hey, I'm interested in like gardening and, you know, should I like cash in my chips and like, you know, buy a farm and have like some, you know, flower farm or something, you know, I mean, these are the considerations you have to consider, but, you know, find the people doing what you want to do and ask them, how did they get started? What do you think? This is my background. What would it take? Um, so kind of keeping it general there, but yeah, that's where I would mm -hmm. where I would begin. Yeah, I think the other the other aspect of that is that how do you decide when something is wise or misguided? And you actually talked about that, and that's the values portion of it. So you so you can you have your interests, you know what what you want to go towards and your aptitudes, but whether it's wise or misguided may have to do with does where your interests lie also fit with your where your values are. So if your value is making a lot of money, then there's certain jobs, you know, certain interests where there's not that much of a chance of doing that. So you, that is where you may have to kind of juggle. That's great. I think Oleg said it better than I said it. Yes, that's exactly what I would do is make sure it's in sync because a lot of people say, I want to do this, but I can't live on that income. Well, then you can't do it. I wouldn't recommend you do it. It's going to probably throw off other areas of your life. So there's a, there is a way, but maybe a way, but like when someone said I could have been a surgeon in my thirties, I was like, I I'm not going to, it's too late for me. I'm, I'm not going to go down that road. So you kind of say, I don't, I don't value it. It's not where I'm headed. Um, but that's a great point. Oleg is th this is where it's all connected. And I don't want to get too broad, but it is. Yeah. Well, that's why there's, it's, it's, it's so great that you cover different kinds of assessments, you know, values, aptitude, skills. I mean, these things all connect to give kind of a holistic picture of where somebody is. So let's get to the next question here. What about artists or actors that have to work a survival job? I'm an actor that just wants a successful acting career, but it's very challenging. So I have to work to keep a roof over my head. Unfortunately, I don't want to do other work, but also unfortunately, I'm good at so many things that I can do practically anything. How do I figure out what work I want to do while still hustling to make an acting career happen? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I live uh, close to all the studios. I'm very uh, networked into a lot of people who I think I live in Burbank. I'm the only person not in the entertainment business. I'm the only maybe career coach working with some entertainers in the area, but it is um, you know, I always say, I think of actually actors as more entrepreneurs. So you've kind of referred to it as like, um, you have to work a survival job. I think of you guys as like entrepreneurs, hustlers, side gigs, uh, the side the gig economy, you know, I kind of see like, because you have many interests, you're like me, we have many interests, we would not be happy doing one thing, you know, for the rest of our life, and you're creative, you know, you kind of have to think about, again, as Oleg just clarified, you know, what do you value? Is it a certain amount of money, identifying what jobs will kind of be that survival job, but maybe, it's a survival job that's also paving a different path. So if you decide one day you you love acting, but in five or 10 years, you might say, you know what, I'm kind of over it. I want to pivot into something else. You've kind of been paving a separate road that's still in line with your creative abilities, everything you bring to the table and your experience. So it is, um, you know, kind of that challenge between I want to continue as an actor, but I do have to have my day job, if you will. And again, I think having that community is important. The support cannot be underestimated. If you want to be in your industry, that's also a great way to network. So, you know, kind of keeping up with your tribe, your community, the support system is huge. That's also how we find out about jobs. That's, you know, I know there's auditions and, you know, maybe it's more open, but kind of just keeping your ear into the way things are happening, maybe that's some way to kind of do more of the acting and less of the, the day job. So I don't know if Oleg, if you want to kind of weigh in on that one as well, but it is, that is the balance with especially a lot of creatives. So like, I love my craft, but I got to pay the bills, especially in LA, you know, where we, where most of us are probably calling in from. Yeah. I mean, it's a good problem to have to be good at everything. And I, I, I found that a lot of actors, a lot of comedians, they tend to be really intelligent, and really, really good at a lot of different things. Um, and so I think getting as close as possible to kind of a, the creative process that's similar to similar to the feeling that one gets when going on stage. You know, if you, if you, for instance, love the rush of being on stage or being in front of the camera, I mean, there are jobs that will let you do that, you know. So absolutely. And maybe it's yeah. things like, I, I mean, I teach these classes, right. Or I do these workshops. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of like being on stage. I don't think of myself as an actor, but you know, if that person is in the creative, maybe there's things they do that are, they're still leveraging the same skills. Maybe they're teaching acting classes. Mm -hmm. And so it's a stable kind of day job. It allows them to network with other like-minded professionals and it kind of keeps them in the space. And so the, the day job doesn't always have to be like the survival job doesn't have to be separate from the acting. In my opinion, there are a lot of day jobs that kind of support. And again, it's just brainstorming, 
um, your values, your interests and saying, okay, actually that's maybe not something I would have considered, but if you can merge your interests and have a day job that's still in the, in the industry, whether you're working for a studio or you're doing something like that, um, you know, bridging that is, is always recommended. Yeah. Um, so thank you for your presentation. I do not have a question, but I would like to hear some inspiring words from you to a person who's trying to find his way in his thirties. Well, I will say uh, to the anonymous, is it anonymous or no? Thank you for your feedback. I'm glad you enjoyed the presentation. Um, I think in terms of inspiring way is, is, you know, in your 30s, it's not too late. I made a career change to be a career coach uh, about 10 years ago. So I was in my mid to late 30s at that point. It's what I do now. And I, you know, I certainly, it was a long road in kind of getting to that point. And, and I found my way through trial and error. And I feel like I've made it my mission to help other people find their way in a more thoughtful process or more methodical way um, because it took me a long time to figure it out. And once I figured it out, I was like, oh, this makes sense. But I just never thought this was a career choice. I never thought, nobody told me like, you could be a career coach and this would bring all, you know, so sometimes it is the trial and error. I would just say, give yourself grace, maybe ask the people around you and, and say, hey, you know, get their, in, get, you know, their info. Sometimes people give us feedback about ourselves that's really encouraging that we never see for ourselves. And when I started sharing that I was doing coaching, I can't tell you how many of my friends and family said, oh my gosh, that's totally what we always thought you should do. You're like, you're would be great at that. And, and I'm thinking, why didn't you tell me this before? So I would say maybe ask, your loved ones, your friends, family, anybody you can, and, and just say, hey, what do you think I should do? Like, what do you see me as? And you'll be surprised by the encouragement you might receive or that I hope you receive because it was eye-opening, you know? And I think our people around us tend to know us and they say, I really I really wish you would have done something like that. Um, so I would just say, you know, keep at it, do some of these tests and feel free to email me if you're kind of confused about any results, but the interests and the values and things, it should give you some ideas. Um, but it is, again, finding that support and getting some encouragement, it might help you kind of uh, figure it out next. So I do wish you the best of luck. It's not easy. And sometimes, you know, people are in their 50s or 60s and they think they've had many careers and they've only finally hit upon what they're meant to do. And that can happen at any age, you know, so just be open, be open. Absolutely. You can do it. You can do it. So uh, I think you covered this a little bit. Are all tests free online? No. So in the resources tab, um, and I can pull that up again. I'm not sure if I'm able to pull that up yeah, again. Yeah, go back to us. There, there we go. Yes. Yeah, so we'll go back to that one. So most of them are free. There are a couple of the MBTI. Those are paid tests. I think the career one is about $59.99. The MBTI type is maybe $79.99. That's more overall personality. Mm -hmm. um, the strong interest tests are probably priced around the same. That's in the MBTI family as well. Um, the Johnson O'Connor, that's expensive. I don't recommend that unless you're somebody who really wants to make an investment in maybe some of your hidden talents. Johnson O'Connor runs about, I think it's like $800 and they sometimes offer $100 off special. Um, that's in person. That's a proctored test. And that's where you're going to kind of get deep into like, are you a natural musician or artist or, you know, what do you have a knack for? So that that's the, the highest paid test. Everything else, the ones with the asterisks are the paid tests. And they're about 50 to $70. Um, the ones that are unstarred on asterisk, those are free. And I recommend you always start with the free tests before you invest in any paid test. A lot of my clients, if they pay for anything, it's usually the MBTI. That's one people are familiar with where you get your kind of personality tip. You're an ENFP or an ISTJ. You might've heard that over the years. Some of these, you know, you've probably taken maybe in high school or, you know, a while ago, but yes, most of the ones on here I, I recommend are free and I hope will be helpful as a starting point. A lot of them, the free ones especially, have an upsell after so that you take the test yes. and you get your results and they're like, we'll tell you more for $10. Yes. Um, so, and that's yes. usually optional. Yes, that's a good point. But the library has books about some aptitude. So if you take the, you take the tests and then you want to know more, search the library to see if we have a book about that test. And then you get, might get or more Or a YouTube. Or you, yeah, YouTube yeah. videos. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So you may not have to pay that extra money to learn more. Um, okay. Libraries, plug for the libraries. Great free resource. One of the best, you know, I like uh, it. free resources we have. You could get your whole education through the library and people have. They sure have. This is a really interesting question. What if you have okay. conflicting values? For instance, you might feel passionate about something, but it conflicts with staying at home with the kids, but will then, but will change when they leave home. Yeah, so this is a great question and thank you um, wh whoever shared that. Um, you know, conflicting values is a lot of times what I see with my clients, they're torn between like, do I work? Do I stay home with my kids? Do I take care of an aging parent? Do I quit my job to do that? You know, there's a lot of factors and this is where I would encourage you to, maybe you're gonna be the person that takes 15 to 20 minutes on the values assessment that I shared. Again, it looks like a simple tool, but you need to get very clear about 
what is it right now? And if for the next three months, six months or a year, if you say like kind of shared, um, it conflicts with staying home with your kids. So if for now, for the first two years, three years, or even until they go to kindergarten, if that's what you value, if that's your number one, and when you do the assessment, you're going to rank, you know, what your values are, you can, by the way, use that tool for your life. Like I'm a trained life coach that does career, but that tool is a life coaching tool. So you could use that to rank your priorities in your life and say, my priorities are my family, staying home with my kids, you know, spending time at my church, you know, whatever those priorities are, we did it for work. You could do that for your personal life as well and kind of set your priorities. So I would recommend maybe using the assessment with your life, you know, your life priorities right now, your values. If you say, I, I just, you know, my number one value is staying home with my kids, then I would give yourself some grace and, and not look for a job, maybe start to pave the foundation for something a year or two from now, and you'll have plenty of time to lay the groundwork. But I would give yourself grace and say, I'm just going to let that go. I, I've had some moms on my calls who say, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm here for informational purposes, but I'm not going to do anything with this information. And maybe I'll call you next year or the year after when my kids start school that's fine. You know, the opportunities will always be there when you're ready um, to seize them. So I would say just get very clear about, you know, you're passionate about something. Will you still be passionate in a year or two? Probably. And if not, well, you know, your interests have changed and you're kind of moving on to something else. But I hope that that helps. And I, I want you to use that tool and in that way might be more useful for you. And I think you brought it up during the presentation. and It's inherent in this question. You kind of talked about it now. Things will change and that's OK. You know, it's fine to, yes. to know that you this is what this is how it is now and you know you're working working with your current values and then know that you know if you can predict the change like you know the kids will leave home so you know that's going to happen so you know that's going to change but sometimes you can't predict which higher value is going to change and that's okay too and sometimes life just happens and something will happen and you know and, and the same thing happens if you're employed you might lose a job or be laid off or something might happen to a family member and you just quit because you're like, I need to be with that family member. So there's a lot of reasons that we have interruptions. I prefer to call them pauses, you know, than gaps. Mm -hmm. Like you're taking a pause from work, but you're working all day long with your family. You know, you're just not getting paid in the traditional sense. So, give yourself, you know, grace that what you're doing is important. And if you've decided mm -hmm. my family's my number one, then you feel confident letting go of some of those opportunities, even if they'd be cool. Like, oh, that's a great, that would be a great job for me, but it's just not the right time. And there will mm -hmm. be, there will be a right time. Exactly. But what is considered early career? Early career. So, and again, you ask different career coaches, they probably say different things. I think your early career goes right up until you're about late 20s, you know, even 30. Honestly, you're kind of high school. Some people go to college or, um, you know, some college. And so your 20s, like that first decade, you know, in my opinion, is exploration. I mean, we spend our lives in school and people go to school for, you know, what, 12 years, sometimes 16 years or longer. And that's all they've done is go to school. So when you get out of school, you kind of have to give yourself maybe not an equivalent amount of time, but in my opinion, an almost equal amount of time to pursue what is in the world. You know, the goal, I think for younger generations, I had the opportunity to speak to some preteens and teens, and I hope to get to speak with them again this year, because that's where I want to reach people, not to scare them about career, but to empower them. Because if you can be learning some of these things, you know, in your teens and, you know, before you even get into your twenties, you can save yourself a lot of time, you know? So I think it is, um, early career for me and maybe Oleg, you have a different opinion, but like, mm -hmm. you know, teens, twenties and late, late twenties. And, you know, probably where I would cap that at least 10 years yeah. professional experience. I don't have so That's much early. of a different, uh, opinion. I think it's just approaching it from a different perspective. So in like in the library world where the library is many people's second or third career. So there's people who are coming into the profession in their fifties, you know, sometimes in their sixties, maybe in their seventies, mm -hmm. you know, there's no, there's no cap. So that's great. So for in that sense, early career would be the first, you know, the first few years, the first five years, the first 10 years, depending, depending on how quickly you progress and how quickly you become comfortable with it. And so you, you can be an early career librarian in your 50s or 60s. And then, you know, when you're in your 70s or 80s, then you're going to be a mid-career librarian. That's totally fair. Good point. Good point. That's a good distinction. I wouldn't have thought of that. And I always say, you know, ask a person who's in their later years, you ask someone in their 70s, 80s, or 90s, what's early career? And they'll probably tell you, like, you're a spring chicken until you're, like, 50. They're like, oh, you're a baby. You're young. You're a baby. Right? Just ask an older person. And the wisdom they have is, is for a reason. Um, but yes, early career is probably the first third, might be the first third of your working years. I'll take that beginner's mind. Exactly. That too. I love I that. Great question. So I took several of these kinds of assessments, but they tend to say writing or teaching, and I haven't found great success in these areas. Is there an adjustment I can make in how I read the assessments? So this is where you'll kind of get uh, some of these tests. Like I mentioned, they measure multiple variables. It's, they measure your aptitudes to some degree or your strengths, interests, and personality, and they kind of spit out results. And that's where 
you know, you might get a result like writing or teaching um, because it's leveraging certain skills. So maybe I would say it's maybe it's not about the actual uh, what you're doing, the writing or the teaching. Maybe it's that you prefer to be more of an independent contributor like me, kind of have autonomy over what you're doing. Maybe you want to be a subject matter expert. You know, when I see teacher or writer, those people are kind of more of the subject matter experts as opposed to a generalist. You know, you might be somebody who has more specific. So whether it's the teaching or the writing, maybe it's that kind of mastery of something where you're kind of like the go-to person, the resource type person, you can kind of share information or you like to do so. Maybe you like to kind of be in that position of sharing your knowledge. So it, I would think about what do those jobs have in common and maybe what are some, some themes there? I, I hope that answers your question. And, and, and again, these are, they're going to spit out specific things. You know, I had a client, she was told like she'd make an excellent pilot and she's like, I don't want to be a pilot. I'm like, but what this test is telling you is that you're comfortable in a high risk situation with 300 people's lives on board. Like she was okay with that. That would be like my worst job. As I told you, like I have no high risk is not my thing. So I told her, I said, you don't want to be a pilot. You're not going to become a pilot. But what that's telling you, what do pilots have? They have composure. They have, you know, they can manage risk. They like, they like it. She thrives on it. Like big projects. I said, you need bigger projects and you need more. So you have to interpret your results for you. And, and, you know, I think the same goes here. Yeah, the you might be an expert to help you. They're not, you know, they're not like the, you know, they don't, they don't stamp who you are. They kind of give you a general idea. Correct. And if it doesn't fit, just let it go. But think about what are the qualities of a person in that job, you know, and, and how might I fit? That's what it, that's what you're looking for. So I feel like lots of jobs assume that the next step in career is always towards a managerial role. I think you met, you talked about this a little bit. Um, Jen, how do you decline a promotion like this without seeming like you're not a team player? That's a great question. I don't know if where you're working, if they use any assessments or you have opportunity to be a part of any professional development. I think this is kind of a conversation you might have with your manager, with your supervisor, and maybe it's during a performance review, or maybe you bring some of the results of your assessment to your next performance review and say, hey, a lot of you know professions track into leadership. It's really not for me. It doesn't fit my lifestyle with my family, or it's just not what I want to do. Um, and it's also just not a good fit for my personality. And I've actually taken some tests that I feel kind of support my feelings. And I want to talk to you about maybe some ways that I can leverage my expertise in this organization. I don't want to leave. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to start over. I'd like to be here and be a part of the, you know, the organization going forward, but in a different capacity. And maybe you can kind of move, move laterally instead of moving, you know, up. Um, I think that's something we need to be very okay asking for. I did, I did not love being a manager, as I said. And it was like, I thought I should do it for the experience, but why? It was just not, it was not for me. And I, you know, I, I learned some skills. I was probably more composed and, and like, you know, quick, you know, quicker on my feet, but it was like, it you know, it was like, why did I do that? And it was for a long time. It was probably like six or seven years. And, you know, it was, it was longer than I wanted to do it. So um, I would say, you know, go into those conversations informed. Nobody is a better advocate for your career than you are. Um, and if your job is not giving you professional development tools, use some of the ones I'm sharing today and, and bring it to your job and say, hey, like this is this is not the direction that I want to head. And I but I still want to be here in a different capacity and just get that conversation started. And they might have other ideas and you might have other ideas. Jen, so we're at 12, 15. Okay. Um, these are really interesting questions. Uh, are you willing to take a few more or? Oh, sure. We... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go another five minutes or 10 if we have to. And. Then we'll wrap up because I know some people also want to jump off and mm -hmm. they don't want to miss the intel, miss the info. Yeah, so let's do yeah, let's do a few more and then yeah, let's do another about five minutes. Yeah, sounds great. So uh, here's an interesting question: If you're feeling burnt out during the preparation for a career, so you haven't even started really the job yet or it's just starting, uh, what can you do to not burn out in other areas as you look to pivot out? So that's a great question. I think, you know, and again, I'm, by the way, I'm answering all these without any context. So if I say something and you're like, that's not true, it's not resonating, I apologize because it's hard to kind of give a general answer sometimes. But this to me kind of ties into um, kind of maybe you want to get in touch with your personality. So if you're burning out before you've even started, maybe, you know, some of the personality assessments will kind of reveal uh, areas that you maybe are like, maybe you have more need for introversion and like, you know, do your work or like have ways to kind of restore your energy in a solitary way versus your job is requiring you to be front facing or be out there and you just don't want to be right. I mean, I don't know what your, your background is, but you know, I would say start with the personality test and see if you can get any insights between your personality and your interests, because if you're feeling the burnout and you haven't even started, you know, it would maybe be a red flag to me as a career coach that this is, maybe it's not the right job like maybe it's the right path maybe it's the right industry and this is another distinction and you know if we if we didn't say it yet you have to be aware like i'm interested in this industry entertainment or i'm interested in this job these are all different things so you might be in the right industry you might be in the wrong job 
you might be in the right field, you might be in the wrong position, you know, so I want you to make that distinction that maybe you're feeling burnt out, because you're in the right space, you have your people, you're in the right tribe, but you're in the wrong job. And the personality test would probably reveal some of the things like maybe you don't like tight deadlines, and maybe your job requires that. And you're like, I don't think I would thrive. So if you don't think you would thrive, and you're kind of at the at the door, I'd maybe 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 look at other doors, you know, before you before you go all in. Just my suggestion. Let's see. Um, can you address how to identify skills uh, skills gap again? What's the best way to approach it? Sure, and that's a great question. So a skills gap, and again, there's a uh, you know this is something that usually HR people do, or they look at your skills versus a job, and they kind of measure your gap. I always tell my clients, you can measure your own gap. Um, take your resume side by side with the job description, look at them together, and highlight. If they have 10 requirements for the job, look at your resume and highlight the ones you have. And you can label whether you're a beginner or expert or pro just proficient at something, you know, because they will require a certain skill level. Um, so the skills gap is simply that kind of HR speak, if you will, for identifying what is the gap between where you are in your skills and where you want to be. And your resume tends to list your hard skills. So that's where I would say if you look at your resume and you look at a job description, which is also on paper, you kind of combine, compare them side by side you'll be able to see any gaps. Like if their requirement is, you know, expert level uh, skills in one area and you don't have it, that's gonna be a skills gap for you. And you're gonna need to bridge that gap. If you really want that job and it's a requirement of that job and they're not willing to train you on it, then you're gonna wanna get that skill before you even probably waste your time applying, to be honest. I mean, if you need a certain credential or, you know, a certificate or something like that to be considered, then you want to probably get that before you invest too much time, you know, applying for jobs and saying, I'm just not getting it, you know, because I lack, certain basics. So you're going to need to figure out what the skills are to, to identify your gap. I hope that's clearer. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's clear. It's part of the assessment process here. Sure. So here's it's an interesting approach. Are there any assessments to help determine what type of employer might be good, might be a good fit for you? Like what industry uh, you might be good for, like academic, government or nonprofit? For sure. Yeah. I, so I would also start with interest, you know, interest being Sometimes your interests, like the ONET, will give you jobs, whether they're government or private company, that kind of thing. Um, your interests, also your personality. And that's where, you know, like it kind of comes in, like I did pretty well in corporate America, kind of being a part of a bigger machine, being a part of something. I really enjoyed that. I do miss aspects of that now. But but at the same time, you know, different things fit my life right now. I value different things. So I'm kind of on this different path right now. So I would say the personality assessments will give you some should give you some insight there as well. Um, not everybody's cut out for government work. Sometimes people want um, this, like they can say, I want the stability of a government job or a municipal job, and that's great, but they may miss some of the flexibility or the freedom or the, like, you know, they, they, there's certain things they might miss or they might feel like a trade-off. So that's where you have to identify your values and say, these are my non-negotiables. Um, and if, if the job meets your non-negotiables, it's, you know, I would say, I would say go after it. Um, but, you know, again, some people are better suited for uh, you know, companies that have a higher level of creativity, a higher level of freedom, they're more innovative. Um, you know, government, I probably wouldn't refer to as innovative type jobs. So if you're a type of person who like is really creative and innovative and wants to kind of constantly reinvent, you probably wouldn't be happy there. And this is where personality assessments can give you insight. And they will. I mean, like the MBTI career and, and some of these free ones as well, they will give you some inspo for careers. Um, and I think that's a great question is, is thinking about where would you be happy as well. Again, that's, I feel like that's a values question because mm -hmm. there's certain, you know, there's certain industries that you're not going to want to get into because you feel like they don't align with your, you know, with your politics, with your values, you know, with, with your ethics. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, those things cut out right away. And it's similar when you're talking about nonprofits or companies, you know, there's some people who are like, who think, well, I would never be happy selling widgets. You know, I need to be yes. helping people. So then in that case, nonprofit yeah. might be a mm -hmm. more comfortable path for you or the right path for you, more, more authentic path. Exactly. If you want mission, impact, legacy, if those were in your top three in the values assessment, and thanks for kind of referring back to the values over and over, because I have, mm -hmm. um, it is, I think, you know, it is all kind of connected, but that is important. Mm -hmm. You know, if you identify those things, then yeah, the government would probably not be the place to go for that. But like a mm -hmm. startup company, a nonprofit, yeah, you'll have a much higher level of satisfaction being in that space. Yeah, it's I, I like they're they really are all connected. That's the that's the interesting taking one Sorry. of these exams, taking taking one, then taking another, and you kind of get a, a the full picture. I, I think I've said that before. Get a, getting a full picture of what what you are looking for and what you can do. 
And it's a little bit of a rabbit hole, which is why I say like, think about where you're headed where you think you want to go and just start there. Because I hate for people to take like 20 tests and kind of be like, now what do I do with it? I don't want you to get overwhelmed by the information that happens. So I would say like, pick Mm -hmm. one, pick one or two personality tests, you know, and stop Mm -hmm. because we do kind of go down this rabbit hole and and there's, you know, they're not going to tell you your number one job. You have to do the reflection to figure it out, Mm -hmm. putting all these pieces together. Or hire I someone. think that's yeah. really the key. I mean, that's the, that's the key there. You, you take the it's test and it gives you some information and then you're like, okay, well, what do you do with it? Some people will go, oh, I don't care. And some people will sit with it and think about it and then, and look at careers and go, how did these connect with me? And that's where the, that's where the growth happens. You know, it doesn't, it's all, it's work. These are not shortcuts. It's work. No. And it is. And it's like, you know, you do have to, nobody cares more than you do about your career. And yes, you might have some resources at work or some caring people and family, or you might decide you want to pay a coach because you're like, I, I really have struggled. And, and I've spent, by the way, I have people tell me coaching, you know, oh, it's a it's luxury. It's expensive. And I get it is an investment. I always say, I prefer to use the word investment, but a lot of times people come to me after investing in college degrees they don't use after going down in a job for 20 years that they're burnt out that has had un you know calculable incalculable costs on their health on their mental health on their physical health and i'm like what does that work to you what is a few months of coaching i wish personally that coaching was offered at you know the high school the college level i mean you have those resources and career services but they're more guidance counselors it's, it's less the coaching aspect where you gain your own clarity so i think there is um just a plug for the coaches out there because the reason we're seeing this now is people are understanding like oh wait i've invested in years of a job or you know a degree that i don't even like and like what a waste of money and time and resources and energy and you don't get those back so i would say you know if you're really if you're really struggling you may want to invest in in some you know the pay, the free resources but also some paid as well so you kind of eliminate that for the rest of your career and you can kind of take ownership of your you know your path so let's do one more question and this is sure. this is about you. In your opinion, which career assessments have been most effective or work for you personally? So, which ones do you like and why? For me, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's your question. Right. So, I like personality because who doesn't like to? First of all, I love tests in general. I'm always like that's the conventional side of my personality. I love taking tests. I love school. I love academics. All this stuff. I think I probably had a great you know, path in academia, but I like personality. Um, like I said, aptitude testing, you know, like what you're good at or not, because things are bad, like things that we're not good at, we tend to not want to do. So like computer stuff, I'm like, ah, I don't like the tech stuff. I don't like, we tend to shy away from. So the things that you're good at, you probably already know. Um, I would say those are the least. And the skills test, same. There's so many skills, like only focus on the skills you care about. If you want to be like, I right now I'm working on my public speaking. Oleg's given me some great tips of resources to go after, like in the next 12 months part of my professional development. So I'm working on that skill, but it's a thoughtful, you know, we, we don't have all the time in the world. So be thoughtful about what you choose. But I like personality. I also love the interests and the values because I, I can't separate them as, you know, um, I, I just don't think there's any separation between like your interests and your values change. Your personality, you know, is more fixed, though you can become more flexible in your personality. Um, so I would say, you know, of everything here, you know, personality, interests and values are my favorite, but I really, I couldn't pick like a, I couldn't pick a number one because, you know, they're, they're really taken together. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. That was a really, you. really, uh, actually it was a great idea for, for, for this presentation. <laughs> I learned a lot and I hope the folks out there learned a lot. And thank you for bringing your expertise to this topic and presenting it in such a cogent and interesting way. Uh, for the folks out there, I have a short survey for you. So we're talking about tests and More questions. Tests. <laughs> This is a really short one, though. This is going to be shorter than any assessment that you'll do, and it's an assessment of this program. So we, I always ask folks humbly to fill out a post-event survey. It's only like three questions, but it's really helpful for us for making these work-ready programs better. So if you have a, a second, please fill that out, and I would appreciate it. And once again, thank you, Jen, for this wonderful presentation, and thank oh, you to all thanks, folks so out I- there. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for asking your great questions, participating in the program, and best of luck in your careers. We'll see you next time.